comrade Eugene McCartan from the Communist Party of Ireland. Comrade Eugene, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Well, as, as Paul said, um, my name is Eugene McCartan. I'm the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Ireland. And I have been a member of the Communist Party for, I think, around 45, 45 years or something. Something like that. A few years anyway. <laughs> One or two anyway, yeah. You've got the edge on me. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you want to tell people a little bit about the, the Communist Party of Ireland for, for anybody who maybe who hasn't heard anything about it before? Now's your, yeah, now's your uh, chance to sell it. <laughs> well, the I suppose i rather just sort of deal with the specifics, history of the Communist Party, uh, which I will do. Um, today we have to look at some of the historical... Um, like the, the, the Communist Party grew out of a particular uh, forms of struggle in Ireland, particular periods of struggle in Ireland, and particular periods of struggle internationally. And um, so, but its origins would be, as you would say, it was formally founded in October 1921 in, in Dublin. Um, but the origins of working class political organisation goes back uh, much further. Um, like everything else, an idea can only emerge when the material base uh, is there for it. Um, I suppose there have been some talk of, among sort of elements of Irish political life or where they would, have, where they would talk about the United Irishman and people like Jimmy Hope. And they would define Jimmy Hope as a, as a socialist. Um, Jimmy Hope would be someone who, had, who was a key figure in the United Irish movement, a weave from, from Antrim. Um, he would have approached his concepts of social justice from his uh, reading of the Bible and understanding of the Bible. So he'd be a, a he would be someone who would his, his social justice was shaped by his interpretation or understanding of the Bible. Uh, therefore, it wasn't necessarily a scientific uh, understanding of society. It wasn't necessarily something based upon the uh, historical experience of the of the working class, because uh, the working class in Ireland at that time was very very small. Uh, it was mainly overwhelmingly in, uh, in the 1790s, but overwhelmingly would have been uh, a rural population that was and before the decimation of the of the um, the genocide of the uh, in the the Great Hunger or was more commonly called the famine, um, yeah. was decimated the peasants, uh, the Irish peasants, and I think that's where uh, that's pre. So he would have been one of those ideas of uh, same with Robert Emmett and uh, Robert Emmett. His rebellion was a a mobilization of what was then the Dublin artisans, um, so the so the precursor to the working the Dublin working class. So there's always been those links uh, between uh, the ideas of national independence, national sovereignty, and uh, connected into in various shapes and forms with social struggle, mm -hmm. social ideas, social values. Um, the most clearest, probably the clearest development of that would have come up through um, with the rise of the. The Fenian movement, um, which to the way was a mass organization, mm. um, and uh, they would have had a, 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 a base within the, the working class in, 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 uh, in the major cities, but also in rural Ireland, uh, that have also would have had a, an important uh, influence in, in the north of Ireland. And it's the only place actually I know of where the term uh, um, Fenian, or what they loosely call it, the north, the Fenian bastard. It's uh, something which, um, it's, which is something which is uh, in common language, where you wouldn't find that anywhere else in Ireland. In the north of Ireland, it should be shows you an, indi to an indication of the actual the impact of the Fenian movement in in that part of the country, and the threat that is perceived to be by the unionist landlords and the unionist business people. Well, understandably so. I mean, it was a threat to business and it was a threat to the aristocrats and so on. I mean, um, we sort of talked about this a little bit before uh, before we went live. Um, there was the Fenian Proclamation of 1867. Um, fantastic piece of writing for anybody who's interested in the history in the history of republicanism, the history of socialism and the working class movement here. Uh, the last couple of paragraphs of it make it very clear uh, the class character of this movement, or at least the, the strain, a strand that was running through it, you know. Uh, they say that uh, we appeal to the highest tribunal for evidence of the justness of our cause. History bears testimony to the integrity of our sufferings, and we declare in the face of our brethren that we intend no war against the people of England. Our war is against the aristocratic locusts, whether English or Irish, who have eaten the verdure of our fields, against the 
against the aristocratic leeches who drain alike our fields and theirs. So it's very there's a class character there, which uh, which is often sort of downplayed, uh, which and I think that's very very important. Uh, and of course afterwards they follow that with herewith we proclaim the Irish Republic, uh, the provisional government, uh, and so on and so forth. But it's a fascinating piece of history, a fascinating text, and uh, yeah, it needs to be highlighted more and more because people we don't oh, yes. really talk about it. Very much so, and uh, they would have been uh, influenced by, and they also would have influenced uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels and the First International, the Workers International, and uh, Joseph Patrick McDonnell, who was one of the leading unions, was actually became involved in the uh, the First uh, International Workingmen's Association, which is the co- commonly called the, the First International. And so they and Karl Marx and Engels and his campaign uh, for the release of the Fenian prisoners. Um, so they shaped uh, an understanding of um, the uh, the role of oppressed nations and oppressed peoples. Uh, up until then, much of much of Marxism, of much of influence, much of, con- of of Marx and Engels and others uh, was shaped by to a degree by European uh, European history, European experience, which are to a degree were of oppressor nations, nations that oppressed other nations, who were colonies and empires. Mm. So we, they, so that, so this is a, a, it was a new introduction into the political theory of Marxism. Uh, was the question of uh, the links between the social and the national struggles, uh, and the struggles of oppressed peoples, how important they really are, central to uh, any struggle against imperialism. So um, to a degree, it, it broadened out the whole idea, the whole scope, away from to a degree somewhat mechanistic, economistic approach to things, and I think that enriched Marxism from that. And to a degree, I suppose Marxism would come from, uh, would come from the experience of the, uh, particularly the Paris Commune and the, the struggle of the uh, the, uh, the 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 Paris uh, working class uh, at that time was also also shaped and developed uh, Karl Marx because his ideas were shaped uh, by the real lived experience, the material experiences of the people. He was an activist, not just a, a writer, a theorist, somebody who sat in. In the, the British uh, the British Library, writing books out of the, out of abstract theory, he was an activist in the active political struggles of both in Germany and in France and in Britain. He engaged in struggle, and it helped shape and develop his own ideas. So it wasn't just abstract thinking; it was actually something bringing in the experience, both of his own experience as he lived it, and um, the struggles that he was involved in. But also, more importantly, he listened and took on board a lot of things what they. The other activists had to say involved in the, in the, in the, in the, in the workers' struggle. So you have that. And then the sort of the next big sort of the Fenians and the for the first con- the, the the first international had um, uh, had, grew, had had actually branches in Ireland and um, places like Belfast, Coed Hill, Dublin, and Cork. Um, uh, so these were very small embryonic um, communist organisations. She had uh, probably linked with the Fenians. Not much is known about them, but we know they existed. Uh, and these are all part and parcel of that, the influence of cross fertilization of the working class movement and uh, and the national independence struggle. So that whole uh, interlinking of the two is all something which is born, born out of historical experience, not some sort of abstract theory. Mm-hmm. Um, the first organized working class party uh, mm-hmm. emerged in Ireland in uh, 1896 when uh, James Connolly uh, uh, came to Dublin on the invitation of the, the Dublin Socialist Society to uh, to establish the, uh, the Irish Socialist Republican Party. Uh, but in other words, that the people who were existed, who were lived in Dublin, who had, who were involved in the Dublin Socialist Society, knew of Connolly, knew that uh, some of his politics and some of their politics. Obviously, they clearly, clearly thought his polit- his politics would be very suitable. And very much in keen in line with what the, how they were thinking, how they saw things. So it wasn't kind of common parachuting in and saying, "This is a, this is what we believe in." Yeah, there's people in Dublin saying, "This is this is a this person knows what he's talking about things which we can identify with, which we think are are important for here." Um, because Connolly would remember he would have come. He lived in Little Ireland, um, in Edinburgh. That's the place that he would have grown up, and the uh, his, his family came from Mon. Uh, it's would have been a place where a rich diversity of uh, Irish voices, Irish experiences. He would have learned all those. A very he working class those. area. He would have heard well. the stories. Yes, very much so. He was when he used to grow up. One of his first jobs was growing, gathering up the horse shit from the, the number of horses. That was his job. He was a cobbler, so he lived. He lived the life of a worker, 
but he's also what what later would become known by Antonio Gramsci would have described as a, a got an organic intellectual, not a, or someone who became an intellectual out of his deep experience and understanding of his own experiences and the experiences of his class around him. So I think you have Connolly came to Ireland with that rich experience. He would have heard the stories of the Irish struggle for independence. He would have heard the stories of the famine, the impact of the landlords. So they would have all enriched his own experience and understanding of Ireland. So I think that he was a natural candidate then to, to, to be invited to come to Ireland to set up the first party. And so that was in 1896. Mm -hmm. And he founded the paper, the, the Workers' Republic and the manifesto of the Socialist, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Irish Social Republican Party. And where Connolly began to flesh out this idea, this um, this idea of the uh, the link between social and national struggle, between the social emancipation and national freedom were interlinked. You couldn't separate the two. Um, and that the important role that the working class plays in that, if the working class was to achieve uh, its own social emancipation, then it must be, it must itself uh, seize power of the nation. And within the context of a colonial situation, that would not be possible. Uh, so therefore, breaking the connection with imperialism, with colonialism, was central to that idea of social justice, and social freedom, and social liberation to national independence. Yeah, that's... so that was one of his major, his major, his major, his major, um, his major contribution to to Marxist thinking. Yeah, it's fantastic to, to, to hear that. And thanks very much for, for raising that point, because a lot of the time when we just start, when we, when we try to approach the national question, the first thing that people do is they just go to Stalin, Marxism and the national question. And I'd be interested, do you know, um, do you know the extent of the, the influence coming from Connolly uh, in that direction? Do you know, do you know what kind of influence he may have had on people like Lenin, Stalin and, and all this, the international uh, uh, communist movement? I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, uh, we always we're looking back on to us today. You always find it difficult. I mean, I grew up in a, I grew up in a time when actually there was, there was only a couple of public phones in the small town that I came from. Hmm. Nobody, very few people, working people had phones, and um, so therefore there's a local public telephone, and you had to hope that the young lads hadn't broken up the night before. If you want to make a phone call or get a phone call, if you want to make a phone call, then you had to, uh, or to receive a phone call for re friends or relatives or living abroad and uh, who immigrated, you had to make sure well, I'll go to the phone box at 12 or 11 o'clock on a Friday night and you be there. So we're looking back now, everybody's got, most people now have got a phone, most people have access to the internet. So you look back to the early, late 19th century, early 20th century, most people uh, have massy literacy, massy literacy. Therefore, Books and stuff like that, and papers were very hard, very hard to come by. Uh, workers who were literate, uh, the mass communication, been able to find out what was going on in Russia or in Ireland or anywhere else for that matter, would um, would be very difficult and take time. So, what exactly the influence of of uh, Connolly had on other places? But I think well, Connolly only now actually that do I think that um, for instance we have found uh, in places like Venezuela they're very interested in his concepts of the link between the social struggle and the national struggle in Venezuela for national independence and national sovereignty. And I think also in, in South Africa, there was a growing interest in them. Um, so there's a whole beginnings of, of an understanding, beginning to understand this um, this link, but this important and, and, and unbreakable link between social emancipation, socialism, the fight for socialism, and the whole question of national sovereignty and national independence. So I think that the so that's where Connolly's um, Connolly's main big contribution was in, in that whole area. Uh, whenever Connolly left and um, uh, they tried to build them, I and when Connolly set up the party, it was in in Thomas Street. I think there's about a dozen people at the meeting, and uh, so people people despair about uh, oh, not many turned up for the meeting and stuff like that. If you look back at that time, uh, twelve people, and you look at the ideas and values that he stood for with that little organisation promoted through their newspaper, the Workers Republic. They are so vibrant today, so real today. So you can't just judge something by the number of people who turned up or the number of people in the organisation. It is how those ideas uh, resonate among the people. Do they reflect the real reality and the real experience of the people? And I think that's a crucial idea. And have those ideas lasted? Have those ideas moved down the generations? Have they continued to inspire and shape how generations speak? I think they do. So that's a testimony to the power of those ideas and to his clarity of his thought and to the actual scientific methodology that he used to uh, 
make that synthesis between the struggle for socialism and the struggle for national freedom. Mm. And that was born out, of course, over the 20th century, a place like Vietnam yeah. and so on would have been like a key yes. example of that, of this, this fusion of socialism and the national liberation struggle. So it was proven. Yeah, there would have been, yep, that would have been a big impact. And uh, uh, it's uh, the question of uh, all the liberation movements, and we'll go back, we'll deal with that later, but um, just go back to the whole period of how the, where the basis of the material conditions shapes and how and opportunity how an organization or any organization or any class mm. uh, develops uh connelly is connelly's role also with, with jim larkin in the founding of the irish transport and general workers Union. well larkin founded the transport union connelly came back and uh when he came back from america uh was heavily involved uh, connelly went to america in 1903 uh, larkin founded the, the transport union in 1907 um that was the first expression of an independent working class Irish working class. Up until then, the Irish trade union movement was very much tied into the British trade union movement. Mm -hmm. It was Larkin who began to see the importance of uh, an independent role for the working class um, in, in, in Ireland, and particularly of the, un of, of the unskilled dockers and carters. Up until then, most of the trade unions would have been skilled craft workers. So, kind of, so Larkin began to develop this uh, a whole idea of the struggle around of the, of the unorganized of the great uh, how you became now we'd put the term on it precarious workers gig economy Conley, uh, Larkin, Larkin, Larkin and Connolly did that in 19, 1907 1913 they organized the precarious workers of that time and I think that that's uh, that's some these are some of the lessons we could learn uh, from that period and apply them today mm. um, so I we would classify prayer periods of history it like in the sense of 1913 to 1920s um, was a revolutionary decade in Ireland. It was a decade where the, there was great transformation. The balance of forces had shifted decidedly in the faces in the favour of Irish democracy and Irish sovereignty and Irish independence. And then uh, the counter revolution and the counter defeat. So uh, mm -hmm. Connolly's big thing was to to participate was to to have a very distinct participation of the working class in the national independence struggle and that is what he said about uh, the citizen army emerged and grew out of the as a defense organization the first one in 1907 i think it was but uh, uh, if memory serves me right uh, there was a big strike down in, uh, in the foundry a lockout in the foundry in, in waxford they set up a little police force to try to defend the workers the police the the the, the strikes and stuff they get to, to defend themselves and then, then out of that later grew the citizen army to uh, which became a workers' army to defend uh, the the workers um, against attacks from the DMP, the Dublin Metropolitan Police, on the RAC, and to defend workers. And so out of that emerged then this workers' organisation, this workers' uh, army, and uh, that was the vehicle which Connolly then who he used to push forward a working class um, participation, working class intervention into the struggle for national independence. Uh, so that was an extremely important uh, development from that. And uh, so yeah, a lot of working class activists, the Citizen Army played a very crucial role in the uh, in 1916. They marched and they took over the seas, they, when they seized the GPO. It was, they were, it was the Citizen Army garrison um, in Tuck City Hall in, uh, and also in, in, in up in um, Mercer's up in Stevens Green. So uh, the working class, Dublin working class played a very, very important role at that time, uh, led by Connolly. And one of his key lieutenants uh, later went on to found the, the Communist Party of Ireland. And so you've got, uh, so you've got these, uh, so out of that then with the, the whole, the British thought that they were going to defeat the national movement uh, with the execution of the leaders, uh, it turned out not to be the case. It turned out that the, the national movement uh, grew in strength. Uh, British rule became more and more uh, precarious. Um, and therefore, this, the dragon's teeth of division that the British had sown and had used so, had used so effectively from the, the 19th century uh, began, came into play. And that's where they began then to use unionism uh, as a means to, to, uh, to uh, break the unity of the national, the national movement and also to establish partition which were then was to paralyze political um, uh, struggles and has done and continues to do paralyze the uh, 
these struggles in Ireland. Um, it consolidated two reactionary, uh, a reactionary state in the south and a statelet or a colony in the north. Um, it consolidated um, a clerical state in the south and a sectarian state in the north. And to a degree, the British used sectarianism, used unionism as, as a material force to drive home its political and economic and social agenda in, in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. The carnival's a reaction, so, so, North and South. Now. North and South, yeah. So, but normally left and Republicans say, oh, the carnival reaction in the South. There's a carnival reaction, which was, as Connolly quoted, it was a quote from Connolly, but the Connolly, he applied it to the whole of Ireland. He knew what was going to balance the forces that were being unleashed um, within the national movement, within the national struggle, and against the national struggle, he understood them. He understood their very nature, their essence, and the role they played in the relationship to imperialism. I think that's a, a crucial thing about that, that he understand that the social forces and who what, what, what that were at play. And I think that's crucial. So it led then um, that the communists uh, uh, were involved in um, the the Socialist Party of Ireland, which Connolly founded in uh, and when he came back from uh, when he when he came back from America, he was re rejoined it, and uh, the Socialist Party reemerged after nineteen sixteen. Uh, small again as it was, um, and uh, it was uh, a crucial uh, small organisation, but it played an important role uh, in that. And uh, Connolly's son, Roddy Connolly, uh, was involved in that, and his daughter. Uh, they were all they were involved in the Socialist Party, and out of then when. Uh, the Socialist Party, the but the war, uh, the War of Independence, or some people call it the Black and Tan War. Uh, this is all Republican mythology. The Republicans talk about that the Republic was declared in 1916, and everything after that then basically was uh, either a counteroffensive by the British or whatever. So they would not call probably not call the the War of Independence, the War of Independence. They probably call it the Black and Tan Wars at mm -hmm. the age of British. So, but these are all. This is what. When you go into this Republican mythology, you end up with a very complicated history. But I was thinking that the War of Independence, uh, with the Declaration uh, of the Republic in, in uh, 1919, the establishment of the first doll, uh, I think these are crucial elements in the whole struggle for national independence. And then those involvement, and then in 19, with, uh, with the, the whole War of Independence uh, and the role that communists played in it, and uh, also the, the the influence of the impact that the Russian Revolution made in 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 Ireland when you had thousands of people marched through Dublin in support of the uh, of the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks. The uh, rallies were held and meetings were held in the Manson House in Dublin in support of the, the Bolsheviks, in support of the Russian Revolution. The first the first Doyle sent a representative, Dr. Pat McCartan, to speak to the Bolsheviks about recognition and getting material support. So there was a whole lot of interconnections and the impact of the Russian Revolution that led to then to the importance of transforming or uh, the, there's a break but in the the socialist party uh, the uh, more revolutionary forces uh, broke away and established the Communist Party of Ireland in uh, 1921 and uh, that is about the first party in uh, the first Communist Party uh, that was Roddy Connolly Sean McLaughlin who was uh, he was second in command of Connolly in the GPO he was a uh, he also led a flying column down in down in the Limerick and Kerry area as a uh, with a number of other communists involved in it. Um, so they founded the, the the Communist Party of Ireland in 1921, along with other veterans of the of the uh, uh, the Citizen Army. And so the Communist Party is came out of a fusion of militant class struggle and militant republicanism. So that's the the historical roots of the the party. That's the that's the tradition that comes out, out of. Of, of that, the Marian of the social and the national struggle in that context. And now you, so here you are at the, the top, but here you are at the head. <laughs> head of the ship so, nowadays. Uh, I'm, only, to say, I'm only a very small, I'm a very small uh, fry in this. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I am a, how do you say, an, I'm an activist in the Communist Party. Uh, yeah, so bearer. we have that, yeah, so we have, um, so. Can the, I, can I ask? Period, yeah, just, just, yes. just in, uh, to sort of interject there uh, slightly. Could, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about uh, about Jim Larkin? Because you know Jim Larkin is, is often spoken about a lot in this sort of period, and some people, um, they, I suppose, they participate in almost a kind of like a fandom around <laughs> Jim Larkin, and I think that was <laughs> when he was alive as well as <laughs> now, you know, uh, to this well, day. You know, Jim what, Larkin is. Tell us a bit about your thoughts Jim on Larkin Jim Larkin. Was, uh, was, yeah. 
Jim Larkin was a very, uh, like everything else, uh, um, a very contradictory character. Um, so I remember old comrades who, who uh, members of the party who knew Jim Larkin very, very well. Um, members of the, who became, who came, became members of the uh, Workers' Union of Ireland, the union founded by Larkin. Um, sometimes people have uh, a moment in history and um, Larkin's moment of history in history was 1913. Um, uh, he played a huge and tremendous role in the mobilisation of the Dublin working class. This is the lockout, great, the Dublin 1913. Yeah, the lockout. lockout. Yeah, he gave, he gave them great courage. He gave great leadership. He inspired them in very, very difficult times against the, both the, the employer, the boss class, and also against British imperialism. Um, who were backing up the bosses. Uh, he did inspire them, he motivated them, he kept them going. Um, when he went to America, he ended up in prison uh, in Sing Sing. Uh, and uh, he was briefly a member, a founder member of the Communist Party of the United States. Um, when he came back to Ireland, he thought he, when, uh, he thought he could just return to the position of uh, the General Secretary or the leader of the uh, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. But when he came back, he suddenly realised that wasn't going to happen. There was a huge uh, resistance against him. Uh, there was a strong reformist element with had taken control of the union at that time. And so Larkin then basically says he couldn't be leader, then he's going to be set up his own organisation to lead. So he set up the Workers Union of Ireland and... Um, uh, that uh, to the way it was a small, uh, small union. A lot of it was uh, uh, sort of rural workers and did some work among uh, sort of rural workers, workers, uh, farm workers and things like that. Um, but he really played then. He was uh, he set up his own party, the Irish Workers Party. Um, and that was recognised by the common turn because to a degree because of Jim Larkin. Jim Larkin being a well-known figure. He classified himself as one of the leaders of the world working class. Uh, um, so he was a difficult character, um, uh, very, very much driven by his own, uh, what he believed to be right. Whether he didn't really uh, take much heed of other people's opinions, didn't take much heed of democracy of a, of a movement. It was driven by what he felt was right, the right thing to do at a given moment in time, and therefore he became very. He was a very volatile individual, not a not a very good person to try to build working class um, unity, working to build working a disciplined, organized working class force. Uh, and to, so he was a, a figure which is both, uh, he was a figure that had played a role and then a figure who played a very disorganizational role at the same time. So he's a very contradictory figure. He's not, uh, while we would admire his role in 1913, uh, we don't necessarily think he's the, uh, uh, he left very little of an ideological, very, very little of an ideological uh, understanding of anything. Um, his understanding of, he was more of a guts fighter, a street fighter than a theoretician or of a strategic thinker like Connolly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So uh, so his, his, foot in his, 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 his place in history is centred around the Dublin, the Dublin lockout in 1913. And after that, it's uh, really, it is one of someone who was a figure uh, who played a role in the labour movement, but I wouldn't exactly say he was. Uh, but they would say the working class of Dublin never forgot him. On his funeral, tens of thousands of them come out to line the streets for his for his um, his funeral. But it was an indication of what the role that he played in 1913 that he was never forgotten by the Dublin working class, and he still is not forgotten. Um, but he's not an ideological figure. He's not a um, a trade union figure that we could. You could say he left a body of work about how to organise workers, per se. Mm, mm. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much for, for shedding the light uh, on, on that issue um, because there is a lot of confusion. But uh, as you said, there's a lot of good stuff maybe earlier on, but then as, as with many many of these uh, figures later on, uh, sometimes things go, get a little bit uh, go awry, as they say. Um, no so, yeah. <laughs> Get a bit pear shaped, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks very much for that. Let's push it. Let's push on forward now. So uh, we we've, we've sort of come up to the rise, and we've moved on a little bit beyond that. We're sort of we talked a little bit about the you know Black and Tan War, War of Independence, uh, <laughs> Counter Revolution. Uh, after that, where does the communist movement uh, in Ireland go? Where where do we go from there? Yeah, the, the the communist movement. I'll just go slightly back. That the communist movement during the whole War of Independence, um, we 
attempted to, the Communist Party attempted to, uh, to engage with the Republican leadership. I don't mean, I don't mean the, the free state, but the Republican leadership, they're saying that what they needed was an economic and social program to bring to the people, to bring to the working class, that they had alternative ideas to where society needed to go to. Uh, we didn't win that argument. We won, we won some of them over. People like Liam Mellows, um, uh, uh, McKay and uh, Paddy O'Donnell, people like that. We won them to that position, but we didn't win enough of them. We didn't win the key leadership to that to that position of need for a uh, not just a, a struggle against the, the partition, against struggle against the, the imposition of the of the uh, of the partition and the settlement imposed by the British, uh, but we needed a mobile we needed a political program that the masses could identify with. And then our argument, uh, it's still an argument goes on today, uh, but that's where we went, and and, and the, the party then dis, was disbanded in 1925. Uh, under orders from the from the common turn because of um, they believe that Jim Larkin is going to be the person. So the party then re-emerged a couple of times, the Irish Workers' Party, the Workers' Party of Ireland, and, and then events eventually then in the late, early 1930s, the, the, uh, we, a number of revolutionary, what was called the Revolution Workers' Groups were established around the country to bring together uh, uh, trade union activists, uh, Community activists, uh, tenants organizations, small farmers organizations, Republican, former Republican activists, uh, communists who came together to these revolutionary workers group groups, and then in 1933 they then fused together and formed the Communist Party of Ireland, which has that has been in continuous existence since then, uh, since 1933. So um, that was a very important period uh, that brought together it was a. I have to remember the communist movement would have been very young at the time, and um, same with the common turn. So mistakes were made or because of its youth and enthusiasm. But the common turn left a huge legacy. It uh, it um, it built uh, and helped support uh, the building of working class organisations in across the world, uh, and particularly the oppressed and colonised peoples. They uh, sent uh, activists and resources in to build um, uh, organisations, trade union organisations, working class workers organisations. Right across the right across the world, so it played a very important role in, in beginning the, the establishment of a of a radical anti imperialist workers movement uh, globally. So, with all its faults and failings, all its criticisms people make, uh, I think it played a very very central role in the development of that. Uh, it also played a very important role in the def in uh, in sort of challenging uh, social democracy and on the. Um, the whole reformist attitude, reformist role inside the trade movement, I think, it played a very important. Again, in the 1930s, we uh, the, the Cormans were involved in the Red the Red Union, Red Workers International, uh, Castle Coleman miners from uh, Kilkenny, uh, a group of mine called Slate Workers. Um, they were members of the Communist Party. They, the Quarry Workers, they uh, were involved. The Red International they were on strike for a long time, a lockout, and but eventually they were defeated and beaten and. Um, they paid a heavy political price for for it. So these are all uh, important elements. And um, it was also in the nineteen thirty four, the Communist Party was uh, uh, central in the whole foundation of the establishment of the, the Republican Congress, um, led by like the Gilmore Brothers and Padre O'Donnell, uh, Frank Ryan, people like that. And uh, then you had. Sean Murray, who was the general secretary of the Communist Party from 1933. Sean, Morris, Sean uh, Murray was a former IRA commander from the Glens of Antrim, fought in the War of Independence, um, and then uh, joined the Communist Party. And he had a very, him and Pat O'Donnell were very close allies, political allies, as well as in friendship. And they uh, put, put a lot of work into building the, the Republican Congress in 1934. And... Um, uh, 33, 34, and you had uh, then it was uh, short lived, but it was involved in very militant struggles around the whole tenants or tenants rights and tenants strikes. They had land struggles, they had occupations of of farms, they had cattle drives where they uh, all types of things took place against landlords. They opposed the the land annuities and other paying rents to British absentee landlords uh, and the land annuities to the British government. Um, so. They were involved in lots of uh, land agitations, uh, industrial disputes, tenants disputes, um, over water rights and everything else. So that then and the but that split and the, there was a divisions emerged 
um, over there was there to be a, was this to be a fight for a workers' republic or a workers' and small farmers' republic? Um, not to disintegrate then in the Republican Congress, more or less split, and uh, so that led them into 36, 37, 38, uh, uh, with the establishment of the international brigades in Spain. Um, quite a few of the most, um, I don't like using the term, but it is true, politically true, that they, the most advanced political uh, activists of the communist and republican movement uh, left to fight in Spain, to fight fascism in Spain. And they left on the basis that uh, because of the, the uh, thousands of uh, blue shirts, uh, what was then the fascist organizations established by the uh, the the antecedents of today's Fianna Gael, uh, government, uh, Fianna Gael party, the antecedents lay in the fascist movement of the 1930s, the Blue Shirts, and uh, John A. Costello and all them is pra and it all praised the, the rise of the brown shirts and the black shirts in Europe. And sooner than later, the Blue Shirts would emerge triumphant in Ireland. That was the words of John A. Costello and, and the Irish Doyle. Uh, and back in the 30s, uh, the Blue Shirts didn't triumph. There was a lot of street battles and street fights against the, the fascists in, in Dublin at that time. Uh, and then whenever O'Duffy led, I think it was about seven or eight hundred of them off to off the fight in Spain uh, for fascism, or as he said, it was for, for God and country. Uh, um, then uh, the communist movement um, the, said that they would uh, answer the call as it was issued to establish international brigades. And they then, the communist movement then was uh, instrumental in uh, getting volunteers to come from the Gulf from Ireland to fight in Spain. And quite a few of our most uh, leading thinkers, activists, uh, died on the battlefields of Spain, but also including people like, uh, we lost people like Frank Ryan, who wasn't a member of the Communist Party, but a very close ally of the Communist Party. He, he lost, he was captured in concentration camps, then brought to Germany, and then um, he died in Germany, um, and then the Communist Party then eventually in the 1980s, 70s or 80s, we managed to get his remains brought back and reinterred in Glasnevin Cemetery. But I quite, we lost uh, quite a few of our comrades, uh, their bones now lie in, in the battlefields of Spain. Quite a few couldn't come back to Ireland, and they ended up uh, finding uh, work in in, uh, in, um, in Britain and America. Uh, those who did come home find it very, very difficult and very, very hard to find work. Uh, these were the times of the 1930s, was vicious, uh, vicious anti-communism. Um, at that time, um, uh, people were attacked. People were, uh, the even members of the who came home would say that their families barely spoke to them uh, when they came home. And so uh, it was a very difficult period for the for communists. Uh, the party was greatly weakened after that, and with the outbreak of the First and Second World War, uh, that uh, the party was um, in uh, a weak state. And uh, the and Sean Murray then having to go to, in order to find a living, had to go back to work in Belfast. And the, the party in the South, in Dublin in particular, um, some of them joined the Labour Party to place to find a political space because it was so difficult, the amount of attacks and the amount of vicious anti-communism. Um, but that only lasted a brief period, and they then withdrew from the from the Labour Party and uh, re-established the Irish uh, the Irish Workers League um, and to establish the, a revolutionary Workers Party uh, in the late nineteen forties or mid 40, 46, uh, 40, somewhere around that time period. And um, so that was a uh, people like Sean Nolan, uh, Jeffrey Palmer, um, like that, uh, uh, all sort of re-emerged and uh, founded the uh, Irish Workers League, which eventually became the Irish Workers Party in the South mm. and the Communist Party in the North of Ireland. And then they merged again in 1970 uh, in the heat of the civil rights struggle to merge into one party, uh, the Communist Party of Ireland. So that is the sort of a, a quick a quick brief through in the, in the 1940s, 50s with the onslaught, onslaught of the Cold War. Uh, it was yeah. very, very difficult to, here in, in, in the South for, for communists to actively operate. Uh, our bookshop, which was in Pier Street, was attacked and ransacked a number of the times. Uh, the headquarters of the party uh, in the first party in 1933 was in, in North Great Strand Street there. It's just uh, that runs along parallel to the to the uh, Ormond Quay there. 
um, the headquarters were, were attacked and, and uh, ransacked and burned by a mob incited by the, the, the Catholic mob out of the pro cathedral there of O'Connell Street. Jeez. And the, the, building, the building had come under siege for a week. Um, and eventually they managed to burn it down. But it was IRA activists, IRA volunteers and Communist Party activists who held out for a week. But eventually the guards stood by and let, the, let it happen. But they held out for a week. Of course. But eventually they had to, they had to uh, abandon the building that was burnt to the ground. Uh, but that was the grand street. But in the 1940s, the same thing. The comrades would have told you that, would tell you that uh, that there would be pickets on their homes. Uh, the, uh, the religious right would be uh, <laughs> would be picketing their homes, picketing their place of work. Their photographs <clears throat> and information about where they lived, where they worked, would be published in the Irish Catholic uh, uh, front page, and telling these are the people where they're from, where they live, and and where they work, and demanding that they be fired, be sacked. Uh, that their homes be uh, be picketed. So they a lot of uh, comrades suffered greatly in that whole period in the forties and the fifties, um, with the uh, we say with the bookshop new books was known then being ransacked and, and attacked, uh, people being beaten up. Uh, when we used to hold the May Day demonstrations, it'd be at the if anybody know Dublin, uh, the Irish Press used to have his offices on the, the, the junction of uh, Middle Abbey Street and O'Connell Street. Uh, we used to hold uh, the May Day rallies there. We hold public meetings every week dealing with the whole question of the unemployed, unemployment organisations, um, and uh, rallies in May, they, they'd be under constant attack uh, every Saturday uh, from the mob. So, But uh, they didn't back down, they didn't back off, and they kept uh, the red flag flying. Uh, and one of the big things in the 1950s was uh, uh, the unemployed, the National Unemployed Organisation, uh, where they, they mobilised thousands and thousands of workers, unemployed workers, to around the whole question of unemployment and unemployment benefit and they managed to get a man called jack murphy uh um who was the part who was part of the uh the national uh committee of the national organization of the unemployed uh managed to get him elected to the door um it was so difficult that the communists believed that uh, it was far more important to have the issue of the of the unemployed uh onto the floor of the doll than it was to have a communist elected and they stood back uh, to allow Jack Murphy because they knew then Jack would not uh, would not uh, get the same flack or come under the same attack as the party as a party member would have but uh, it was run by the communist party it was uh, it was a uh, driven and as, as ideological direction and as organizational capacity and his demands were shaped and formed by the communist party we and should much, that's, that's like, worth highlighting actually because we we don't have a tradition here in ireland we we've never had a tra in many other european countries they do have that tradition where they've had sort of um uh, communists in part you know the euro communism thing was very very large and you know like france and italy and all these different places that that's never really been we've never well, to my knowledge anyway uh, i don't think that's ever been something we've had here no no um young jim larkin was elected to the city council uh, uh, briefly, uh, then young Jim Larkin, who was of the 90s, one of the founders of the party in 1930 in the 1930s, uh, he and him and Sean Murray went to Moscow, went to the Lenin Institute, um, or been known as the Lenin Institute, uh, and come back. And he was a for a long time he was a, an important figure in the Irish communist movement. Uh, Jim Larkin Jr., uh, Jim Larkin's son, um, he was a very important figure in it. Uh, they were just some great. Uh, materials relating to the socio-economic conditions of the of in Ireland at the time and uh, but eventually like anything else he took over from his father and uh, the pre sheer pressures um, upon people at the time people may not even recognize may not even recognize that we had comrades uh, up until say maybe 30 years ago if you went into a union office in Dublin down the country even you'd walk in you would find there would have been statues to Joseph the worker or the Blessed Virgin Mary would be over the doors um, we had one comrade, um, Sean O'Rourke, who was an electrician in the corporation. Um, he was a member of the, uh, the electricians' union. They st when, uh, whenever he was elected to the executive of the union by the by his by his fellow workers in the corporation, um, whenever he would never go to the executive meetings, they would start the meeting with a with a decade of the rosary, uh, and they'd finish the meeting with a decade of the rosary to protect themselves from the communist presence in the room. Um, this is not. This is not. This is not uh, making up stuff. This is. This is real. This is real. This is what people experienced. This is what right. people lived. Uh, uh, religion was used. People's sincere religious views were were used and abused by the boss class, by the employers, by the government, by the state. 
um, by the church. Uh, they abused people's sincere belief belief system for political objectives, for socio-economic objectives, and that is to protect the interests of the rich. The rich. Mm. So mm. they abused people's religious views uh, for, in their own interest. They are no more interested. Same way in the north, that they. The Catholic Church had no real interest in the oppression of the Catholic community. It was about how it was to basis it provided them a basis in which they could control the Catholic community uh, in the north. Yeah. And that uh, yeah. really hasn't changed much. So uh, so it's always been the abuse of this been abuse of people's beliefs, which has been a problem. Um, the, so we had in the nineteen fifties uh, the continued consolidation of unionism, of orangeism in the in the north. You had a consolidation of uh, Catholic Catholic action reaction in the south. Um, but still within that, uh, the communist movement continued to fight and battle. Then they argued the question of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, United Ireland was important, that uh, the social and economic questions and the national question were linked. And that led us so constantly to uh, publish James Connolly's writings, uh, the, mainly the little pamphlets of um, uh, the Labour and Irish history, Labour nationality, religion, the reconquest of Ireland. They were all... Um, Connolly's uh, labour on trade union teaching and stuff like we kept them all in print. When we had, I mean, when you're talking about workers, you had absolutely not a um, excuse the French, but hadn't got a nurse in their trousers. Um, uh, basically, raised the money, scrimped and saved, and put it together and got those pamphlets printed up and distributed. Um, who didn't have any money hard enough to feed their own kids, but they did that. They saw, saw that as important. Um, and uh, so and in the 40s and 50s, we did that. And uh, leading up to into the 60s, uh, where we managed then to basically do was to publish on a reasonably large scale the, the writings of Connolly in the small little pamphlet forms. Uh, to you know, Before that, it was all smaller scale, but on a reasonally large scale in the 60s to commemorate to, for the fifth anniversary of the, of the Easter uh, Rising. And uh, I totally think that led the basis then for uh, the whole emergence of the Connolly Youth Movement, uh, the whole re-emergence of Connolly's ideas and his ideas that are shaping, uh, began to shape the Republican Movement, because up until then the Republican Movement was absolutely died in the wool, um, uh, very much influenced by and uh, terrified of the Catholic Church, absolutely bloody terrified of it. And uh, that did it, because I because I go back, I go back a little bit, the Republican Congress had a had a group to the Bowdenstown uh, uh, Wolf Tone commemoration, and the IRA leadership then ordered that they be driven from the actual uh, Bowdenstown commemoration. And on that, on that, on that, um, uh, the the Republican Congress delegation was uh, groups of workers and uh, activists from the Shankill Road, from the Connolly Clubs. It may, it may surprise some people, but the Connolly Clubs existed on the Shankill Road. They were the legacy of the of the revolutionary period. It hadn't been completely smashed and uh, uh, consumed by uh, by. Uh, either by the Orange State or by uh, um, Walkerism. They still had a revolutionary attitude towards uh, politics. and So I think that, so they were, they turned out and they were beaten off, they beaten off the, uh, the Bowdenstown demonstration. So the Republican movement has always had a very checkered history. Mm. Um, and to a degree, it's, it's an element of problem. It's always been a problem um, where if you, go, if you look at it, the, the, the Fenian proclamation was the first proclamation which hadn't any declaration of God in it. The, um, uh, whereas the uh, 1916 proclamation was a cut to God and stuff like that mm. was a big indication of the consolidation of Catholicism, the cons consolidation of of the Catholic Church. As someone described it, that we were uh, that uh, that um, what we had actually was a, a Catholic Church which was shaped by the needs and interests of British imperialism. Um, it was the British who established uh, Maynooth. Um, and they basically in order to prevent Irish uh, Irish people going to the continent where Britain's traditional allies or enemies lay, Spain, Italy, uh, Spain and France, um, to go in there to be picking up bad ideas. Uh, uh, and so they established Maynooth to secure, to, to build a, to construct a church which under their control. And to a degree, much of the Catholic morality, the Irish Catholic morality that, was inflicted upon us all. If you look at it and study it, it's very much a product of Victorian, British Victorian morality. And it's very, very similar in its approach. Very, very similar uh, attitude towards women, towards, towards uh, 
music and culture and things like that. It's very much uh, influenced and shaped by British Victorian uh, value. So, um, so it's not the uh, so it's a uh, it's not as Irish as it wants to claim to be. It's very much a product of British colonialism in, in Ireland. Um, so, yeah. I think that uh, that whole thing of uh, how the, the communist movement uh, was dealing with all these questions are are, are all important. Um, um, because they do, do sort of you only learn from the real material experiences, uh, and you must try to apply them. And as I say, you don't you don't understand you you don't look at history looking backwards. You look at history looking forward to look at what is the experience you draw from and can learn from history, and to apply them to today to shape the struggle tomorrow. So I think that's a crucial question about history. So how do we learn from our history? We learn it that there are that imperialism. Imperialism does not have friends. It does not have friends. It's only good interests. Only good interests to serve than to advance. So therefore we know, therefore when we would look at the European Union, we would equate that as, a, as a, an imperialist block. It's not here to protect Ireland or to advance the Irish people. It is here to protect the interests of imperialism. And so the struggle today between all the talk going on around the, 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 uh, the British going to bring in a new law to do a change the, the international agreement they had with the European Union. All it is, as it was in the past, Ireland is a pawn on the chessboard, the imperial chessboard, the chessboard of where who moves what piece. Ireland's the piece to be moved by the European Union bringing it into play or the British to bring it into play, whichever way it suits them. But it's a struggle between the European Union and the British, uh, the two blocks of imperialism. And Ireland is just a pawn on that table. And all those elements were then Republicans who believed that the British were neutral or the Irish government was neutral. The Irish government is bought and paid for. It's a, it is a, a kept beast. It is dependent economically, politically on its relationship to the imperialism, whether it be British imperialism, global imperialism, United States or European Union. It is bought and paid for. Therefore, it's got little, little or no influence. So the struggle now here over this whole thing is about using... Ireland and the British border in Ireland as a as a chess piece to manoeuvre between the negotiation between the European Union and Britain itself vis-a-vis -vis their, their relationship. So it's all just hot air taking place. Uh, uh, but to go back to that, so that was the real learning this from experience. That's yeah. how, in other words, how do you apply experience? So uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of this state ta taught us many lessons. Taught us one, that the state is not neutral. The state is an active agent of the bosses, an active agent of the of capital. In other words, the state is there to protect capital, to advance the interest of capital, to secure the interest of capital, and also to reproduce the ideology of capital and the culture of capital. So that uh, that's that's what's there about, but also is there with also with the repressive apparatus to make sure that that desire is enforced. But in general, it reproduces the dominant idea through. The education system through the mass media, mm -hmm. uh, through uh, how it how it, it promotes aspects of culture which reinforce this position. So you don't have a collectivist approach towards culture. You don't have a, a collective aspirations within culture. It's all about individualism. Uh, so therefore, that's what it's about. You why would a why would a, why would a state which they're about enhancing and protecting the advances of capital want to promote social culture? Culture which embraces drawing people together, rich enriching people's collective experience, and saying the people that we collectively can produce a great culture and can produce and culture is produced of is a social production product. Hmm. You, I, I think probably for people listening to that, you probably just shattered, <laughs> shattered their <laughs> bourgeois illusions that they've been fed for many many years. <laughs> And, uh... oh, so we have, so we have these are the lessons of it. The other lesson we learned, so say the British, <laughs> the British imperialism does not have friends, only has interests, and these are working their way through. And the Irish ruling class, the parasitic, or what we would call the compador bourgeoisie, yeah. they are they have basically long since given up the idea of national independence. They've long since given up the idea of national sovereignty. They've long given up, long since given up the idea of, even of national unity. Uh, well, they might talk about it, uh, but the circumstances were forced in a certain direction. And I think that's uh, that's where we have to look at is how we learn the lessons of the past. There's no such thing as neutrality in a class divided society. So you're either on one side or the other. 
So we, we, we define ourselves as a very partisan. We are very partisan. We don't, uh, we do not stand on the sidelines and say, well, if, buts and maybes. We don't condemn US imperialism and Soviet imperialism. That's not, we don't agree with that sort of nonsense approach. We say there is a struggle. You take a, you take a, you draw a line in the sand and you stand one side of that line or the other side of that line. And you fight it out the, with the enemy. You don't know who the enemy is. The enemy is imperialism. And you stand with those who are struggling against imperialism. They might not necessarily be the best people in the world. Yeah. But if they're under attack from imperialism, then there's only one place to stand. There's only one place to stand. And you stand with them. And you fight. Because basically, the more we more imperialism is weakened, the more then progressive forces, progressive ideas can develop and emerge. And as Gramsci talked about, uh, that uh, we're in a world of contradictions, a world of the old world is dying, but the new world is not strong enough to be born. This new world is trying to get, is trying to be born, and lots of struggles and lots of contradictions. But that new world is being born as we speak. And I think that's where we need to be need to be to be to be looking at that there is a struggle in the world. You must stand. You must know where you stand. If you don't know where you stand, then you get run over. Mm-hmm. You get run over. Well, yeah, and, and you're seeing this. You're, you're, you're seeing this happening all over the world where you do have imperialism sort of doubling down and there are all these colour revolutions happening all over the place and people don't have this clear understanding of anti-imperialism. They don't, they don't have a clear understanding of the triple lock of imperialism that is the United States, that is the European <laughs> Union, that is Britain, uh, and global imperialism, I suppose. Uh, and so they can be led astray in so many different ways. And uh, as you said, like we're, we're not saying, oh, well, you know, uh, USSR imperialism and US imperialism are equally bad and no, no no you need to pick a side you need to pick a side on this and you do need to be very firm you need to give solidarity to countries like maybe you disagree with them or whatever it might be countries like your your Nicar- Nicaraguas or whatever whatever it might be that you're not 100% sure uh, politically what to think of them but 100% solidarity against imperialism yeah. we either have the right of nations to self-determination if we don't yeah. So who does so? So if the United States and imperialism, the British, the European Union decides what what the extent of your freedom is, what the extent of what you can, what they call the freedom, but what you're allowed to do or not allowed to do. So if you let nationalize the oil and the, all the resources, that's a anti freedom as far as they're concerned. That is, they call the rule of law is to protect property. So when you hear all these establishment politicians and the gurus and the big th- big voice to speak of from Washington or from from um from Brussels, they talk about the rule of law. What law do they mean? It's the law to protect private property, yep. to protect the interest of a minority. Exactly. So there's no such thing. So as the saying goes, law is but congealed politics. It's but congealed politics. So you've got talk, these talk about international right of international law. It is all about the right to protect private property, protect the monopolies, protect big business and big corporations. Nothing more and nothing less. And I think the problem with that the the problem with a lot of the left is that uh, it is confused. It's got tied up in all this jargon, all this talk about humanitarianism and human rights. Human rights, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all the big stick to beat us. The big yeah. stick, the big uh, ideological confusion that comes out, and so then politics are about the uh, the left has really reduced politics down to the. Uh, the whole question of separate the defense of individual rights from the general fight against from the fight against capitalism and to their obsessed with uh, have become obsessed with uh, social groupings and social move, movements um, and put them in a par with class struggle or anti imperialist struggle they're not the same thing they're not the same thing they're, de- they're democratic questions all these questions are, are democratic questions but the the core and uh, centrality of the left it's anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist. Yep. It's to fight the capitalist system, the exploita- exploitative nature of capitalism. That's what we. That's our central core role: is to mobilize the working class against capitalism, against its own exploitation, and against imperialism. And so we've we have been reduced uh, in many ways. Uh, so so, we're, so the left spends its time fighting for, for specific rights rather than actually fighting for the general emancipation of the class, a fight against capitalism. I think that's where we're, we're, uh, we have to get back to that uh, whole question. And the whole question of it's, uh, we've been, over the last number of, de- couple of decades we've talked about, we've been shown the images of, of um, people starving or flood victims and all that. Well, terrible things are happening in the world because of mm. the huge inequality that exists in our world today. The huge inequality of forces and balance of forces. 
And so we are then uh, drawn into the whole question of humanitarianism always, more humanitarian aid and humanitarian support. And we don't ask the question, is that, well, there are people starving, but we need to feed them. Instead of asking the question, are people starving? And you have to ask the question is why? Yeah. Why are people starving? Yeah. And that's the question that has to be asked. Not to say, oh, we need to feed them. It's about why are they hungry? Why are there masses of people with no shelter? Why are there masses of people without any health? Why are there masses of people uh, who die, uh, children who die before they're five years of age? Why? In a world in which we have this, uh, we have surpluses of food. A third of the world's food is wasted. Wasted. Yeah. A third of the most of the water has been destroyed or, or sucked up by corporations like McDonald, uh, like um, Coca Cola and Pepsi and all these other places, or the water companies. So these are we have uh, these are big questions. But like everything else, we start somewhere. You have to start at a small step. We can only change or transform the world from the world that we have here, I Ireland. Yeah. And we make our contribution to the whole to the global transformation. But we can hear only in Ireland. You can't do that global. This glorified internationalism mm. it is an international which is linked to the struggle at, at, a, at the base at home and so it's an international which is concrete and you build concrete relationship concrete relations with other exploited masses of people across the globe and you find common current common unity common purpose and that's the task that we have to face today and the task that we have on on thursday night we have a very good speaker john smith He'll be speaking on Thursday night at half seven. You'll find him on, on our uh, Facebook and other places. Um, you'll find that John Smith has written a brilliant book called The uh, Imperialism of the 21st Century. And I think it's well worth it. Anybody's interested in that. What the, What is the word? Why is my coffee so cheap? And Because why? Because the, the, poor, the poor bugger he picks it is, either has got gets bloody all starvation wages or is dependent or is under the boot, jackboot of some uh, military dictatorship. Why are my clothes so cheap? Because there's thousands and thousands of young girls and young girls and women in Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, who are packed into uh, desperate working conditions to make cheap clothes. And at the same time as they make cheap clothes, they also make an expensive clothes for the bigger shops. So why is that? Why is this? And uh, the, the question of, I mean, where does all this food come from? All these things. We fight because basically we've now ended up with masses, the displacement of tens of millions of people from the land in Africa and Latin America for what? So we can have we can produce grow so they can grow palm oil or they can grow particular types of vegetables which would meet the European market or the American market, not the local market. The local market has been destroyed and displaced. So they end up basically what happens then? People African countries have to import food because their land, which is arable, is producing food for cash crops to be sent to Northern European, to North to Northern Europeans or to North America. So. We've got a whole screwed up economic system, which is actually not alone is it environmentally destructive. It's just going to destroy the planet. It is absolutely screwing the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It's displacing. For the first time in human history, more people live in cities than live in rural rural world, rural, the rural uh, parts of the world. That's a huge thing. Because why? Because the absolute destruction of local economic, uh, uh, local agricultural um, structures have been absolutely destroyed by the European Union, by the United States, by the big global corporations. Absolutely destroyed. So people have been driven off the land into cities to do what? To live in slums and squalor and to, to their kids to die of untold, un of curable diseases. This is the world in which imperialism is creating around us. It's creating around us and is driven by one thing and one thing only. That is profit. In order to secure profit, then you must secure it militarily, politically, ideologically. And where people think today, well, what is an idea, what is what is it? And the capitalism, what's the alternative? People think the system is correct as why? Because it makes it's common sense. Everybody believes it. Common sense, yeah. Nice. Yes. It's common sense to have run capitalism. Well, if you sit back and say you look at it and say, gee. If you were, if you're going to start rebuilding the world, you think really would capitalism be, would capitalism really be formed part of that world? Would it? Would it? Would it be driven by profit, driven by the enrichment of a small clique, a group of indi individuals and corporations? Is that really the democratic way of going about rearranging the world? Will that really change the material basis of of, of, of people? No, I think a real basis is actually set the basis of the priority of economic and social development is the people. 
is people in close relationship to the sustainability of the environment and the natural world. After that, then you will build a more harmonious relationship between uh, humans, human activity, and the real and the material world and the, the natural world. Because you cannot capital is built based upon the built upon growth, constant growth. If it's not growing, it stagnates. So how can you have constant growth in an in a, on a planet of finite resources? There is limited oil. There's limited gas. There's limited gas. There's limited um, ore, iron ore, coal, and all these. There's limited even how we even shown. There's limited even life in the sea, because now the the uh, the uh, the fishing stocks are collapsing around us. Are collapsing around us. So you can't have this permanent growth on a planet of finite resources. If we're going, oh, maybe we're going to actually because growth capitalism is based upon growth because one. Constantly having profits and then more profits and more profits and more profits. So the only way we're going to try to save this thing is by taking the profit motivation out of it and by reconnecting human development to what the planet can sustain. And that can only be done under socialism. It can't be done under any green capitalism. It can only be done under socialism where you reconnect the, the human needs, the human aspirations with the capacity of nature to be sustained, to, to sustain it. That was powerful to the people in the chat. Um, you might, you, yeah, you'll be absolutely unsurprised to learn that uh, I am, of course, a member of the CPI. <laughs> I get to hear this sort of stuff regularly. And uh, yeah, you can see why I'm, uh, I was very enthusiastic and keen on having our comrade Eugene on the on the stream today. Thank you so much for that. That was uh, incredible, incredibly insightful and, uh, for, and and also very motivating. motivating. So thank you very much for, for that, Eugene. Um, I, I'm, I'm hes I, I, I am conscious of the fact that um, I think I think you need to head in about twenty minutes. Is that right? We need to sort of wrap. Yeah, up. indeed. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll push forward with a lot of fish to fry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So maybe we'll push forward with a few more questions, and um, we'll sort of wrap things up with regard to the the question of like history, and we'll do, we'll do a couple of question and answer a Q and A uh, things no that to start at the end of it. So okay, so so moving on then, we sort we sort of looked at the the, the history of the communist movement, sort of. Um, up until we're, we're sort of coming towards the middle of the 20th century um, maybe sort of from the 60s 70s onwards and then also moving into that period uh, of course when the counter-revolution went out in in russia what, what's commonly referred to as the fall of the ussr and so on uh, i'd be very interested to hear and i think the people would be very interested to hear how did the communist party of ireland and how did the communist movement in general uh, respond to these uh, to what was happening uh, at, at, over the course of these, uh, they, these decades. Well they, they, well, they say the most important thing in, uh, from our point of view was uh, was the unification of the party in 1970. That was at the height of the civil rights struggle because the party was heavily involved in the, the foundation of the civil rights and the articulation of those demands. And uh, so the unification of the party was extremely important to us. Uh, it meant a unified approach toward the politics of Ireland, the, uh, the political strategy. Uh, we continue to develop that strategy. Um, and uh, that's where uh, we saw that in the 70s. And uh, at the 70s also was a period of great hope uh, globally. Uh, you had the advances, you had the defeat of US imperialism in Vietnam, you had the, over, the, the collapse of uh, the defeat of the Portuguese uh, colonialism in Africa with the at the beginning the emergence of freedom for Mozambique, uh, Namibia, uh, Angola, Guinea-Bissau. Um, so the, that too, you had the, the, all the, the end of the, more or less the end of the British Empire bar, uh, a few scattered bits and pieces and, and also the six counties in the north. Um, you had the defeat of the, the French were defeated. Uh, and also the liberation movements at that time had been shaped greatly by the influence of the Soviet Union. And we were talking about the, the role of the social and national question being inter, inter, interconnected. Um, to a degree, at a global level, it was that anti-imperialism the Soviet Union was shaped and influenced the, the emerging national liberation movements you saw, who began to see the connections between national independence and uh, social emancipation. And so you had great movements in the change, great movements of change in the 1970s. One chained uh, revolution, you had a whole uh, revolt in Guatemala, and Honduras, um, you had the rise of the whole struggle against apartheid in South Africa and the liberation of Mozambique and Nicaragua and uh, Angola. Um, all over the world in uh, Asia, uh, you had the, the defeat of the French, you had the defeat of the Yanks, 
uh, and the liberation of Vietnam, the liberation of Laos, Cambodia. Um, so the, the whole liberation was spreading and developing um, and growing. And then to a degree, the, the counter revolution took place in many forms in the Middle East, in the form of religion. Uh, it was religion, it was the palism that used uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and also the Islamic forces uh, to counter what they saw as um, Pan -Arab, Pan Arab nationalism. That was Abdul Nasser and uh, people like that who were beginning to push, who were also shaped and influenced by the Soviet Union and the role the Soviet Union played in the, the non aligned movement. And there was a whole block began to emerge. And Palis were no longer the hegemonic power block that it was. And then um, in the 19, uh, within that, then the Soviet Union had too many demands and uh, were made upon it both militarily and economically that caused huge strains. And, on the Soviet system. As I've always, imperialism lasted longer than we thought it would. Um, and that caused, uh, that's to another estimation on our part. Um, socialism was not the deciding force in the world. Uh, the world was still shaped and dominated by imperialism, economically, politically, and militarily. Uh, and so therefore, it was, Soviet Union was operating in very difficult conditions. Uh, it was still a two degree uh, sustaining Eastern Europe. It was sustaining a lot of the liberation movements, training tens of thousands of agmatic doctors, um, teachers, engineers who had been trained in the Soviet Union, changed, trained in the, what they call it, East Germany or German, German, German Democratic Republic, Poland. And they were all training thousands and thousands of, um, uh, how do you say, intellectuals for the, for the developing world, uh, for the liberation movements. And uh, so that was a, causing a huge, a huge strain upon them. And eventually, I think, like everything else, as the material conditions, the contradictions that existed within the Soviet Union eventually uh, brought about um, its demise. So you can either solve con contradictions, will either propel society forward or propel it backwards. It depends how, how those contradictions are, are overcome, how they are uh, resolved. And I think the contradictions that, 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 that were in the Soviet Union, the difficulties that the Soviet Union were experienced were resolved wrongly. They allowed the forces of reaction they allowed the forces of counter-revolution to gain the upper hand. And um, uh, that caused a huge uh, difficulty um, the, for the international working class movement. And uh, uh, so that in the 1980s, uh, our party, while well, we welcomed um, uh, uh, the changes, some of the changes in the Soviet Union, the Glasnost and, and the Perestroika, um, uh, uh, we would also we also realized that um, they also talked about to the Soviet Union and also talked about this sort of question of concept of global rights, global human rights, and all this type of stuff. And um, Gorbachev was talking to Reagan about this universal universal rights. And I go back to the point: there's no there's class rights. Uh, we live in a society where the class of capital, the owners of capital, have rights. Yeah. Workers have responsibilities. Work on that to the way that's where workers have very few rights, but a lot of the responsibilities. Capitalism is the rights, the law there to protect their interests, their the capital interests. And the Soviet Union be talking um, talking stuff like universal uh, rights to a degree was a, a the beginning of a weakening of an ideological understanding of the world in which you live. Um, and uh, I think that's that is the problem to a degree. So it wasn't born out of Gorbachev, there was clearly then there was uh. Existing within the CPSU, there was clearly was political forces and um, how occurrence were beginning to emerge. So therefore, there, was, there had to be a material base for those ideas. One of them was basically was the growth in, in um, nepotism uh, within the Communist Party uh, and the Soviet Union and other parties, I suppose, I suspect as well, because uh, most of the oligarchs and the elements that now ran, uh, particularly after the counter revolutions in Poland or uh, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, the DDR, they were all uh, to the way the, the oligarchs, the people who were in power at the time the, in the Soviet Union, these, these countries, members of the Communist Party, all ended up um, capturing wealth, capturing capital, which is public capital, people's capital. Uh, captured it, sorry, it Eugene, I, I don't mean to interrupt. There's, uh, there's just some uh, interference coming through there. I think maybe there was some tapping or, or, or something like that. Uh, it, just, right. it just cut off just the, the last couple of seconds. Would you mind just repeating there just the last yeah, As I say, the, 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 the counter, the counter revolution um, had a material base to it. And uh, you find the forces that emerged right after the counter revolution and played Poland and Hungary and, uh, and the Soviet Union. A lot of them were substantial figures in the Communist Party, the Communist Movement. 
or in the trade union movement, and, um, they basically seized the people's assets and turned them into private assets because uh, they were in a position that a position of power to secure that to do that. So it begs the question. I don't go down the road. I don't go. Down, I'm not into someone who's into the the as one of the comers would say, uh, the cult of Stalin or the other, the anti cult of Stalin. Uh, I neither see he's neither good nor bad. I don't deal, try not to deal things in moral terms, but deal with, with concrete material conditions and concrete experiences. And I think that the, once you bring in, it's, once you start to sort of moralizing about politics, then I think it's a road to, it's not a road to where you can actually find answers. So it's only a road to where you become more and more ideologically confused. Uh, so I think the whole question of the roots of the counter revolution go back, go back into the history of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, I don't agree with uh, that. Uh, there were the roots lay with, with Khrushchev um, and the Khrushchev light and stuff like that. And that's um, the ABCs of history. Because um, uh, to an degree, well, he was in the Central Committee in the Political Bureau of the Communist Party. If he was such a charlatan, how the hell did he get there? Um, so it poses a question whether whether there actually political weaknesses in the actual how people became leading figures in the CPSU. I mean, mm. did he get there because he was good or was it because he was a charlatan? Mm. And so these are big questions. I think the roots probably go back to to a degree an element of them. Actually, the the the, uh, the how to say the actual the furnace of the revolution, um, the whole Bolshevik, uh, the what happened there, and the, the whole the role of the state um, at that time. And uh, the Soviet Union was so vast, so big. Russia. I mean, the Bolsheviks were a tiny organization. So there's serious questions about. I'm, I, uh, you need to study, I think it needs to be studied more rather than the crass uh, sort of anti-Stalin stuff or the crass pro-Soviet, pro-Stalin stuff. I think we need a deeper analysis of this uh, because I, to a degree, I think it's, it's crucial to the whole idea of the state, the nature of the state. So to a degree, I would think in places way by on the outbacks of the Soviet Union, you know, the Tsarist Empire at that time, uh, I tell you, the social and the state infrastructure was probably more the old Tsarist ones. And so if you had turned up to a mountain, into a valley or down to a place, yeah, they probably took on board some of the former state apparatuses who quickly saw which side the way the wind was blowing and joined, joined changed forces. So and elements of that, elements of, like Lenin said, that every every state, every cook must learn to, to know to run the state. That doesn't say you have to learn how to run the state, but they know how the state works and how to learn it, how to run it. Uh, so the constant day struggle about that uh, so you're never going to get through communism or through socialism where the world is dominated by imperialism. Uh, so Khrushchev did. Of course, he made that nonsense statement that uh, were in the beginnings of communism. Mm -hmm. uh, absolute nonsense. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that's so we have to ask, well, how the hell did he become general secretary of the Communist Party? And, and uh, other than basically that yeah. within there, there was a there was weaknesses, ideological weaknesses, which are there. And, and they're all a product of the past. How you understand that past um, how we learn lessons from that. And I think these are crucial. So, but in the 1980s, whenever the kind of revolution took place, it did impact upon the Communist Party. We didn't lose, we lost some members. Um, it created more demoralization, I think, across uh, across the, the working class movement in Ireland and across globally. And no matter what uh, the working, maybe even the Social Democrats and other anti Soviet elements, they all recognize, whether they liked it or not, they all recognize that. A lot of their rights uh, and, and advances made were secured on the backs of the Soviet working class, of, of the Soviet working class. It was their advances that allowed us, created the space for us to advance because the ruling classes across the world had to compromise, had to compromise because basically the alternative was what? The alternative was revolution. So they compromised enough to stave off revolution and the overthrow of capitalism. Uh, so they compromised on that basis, but they continued the mass plunder of the third world. Uh, but in Europe and North America, they bought off enough of the workers to secure the material the material interests of imperialism. Uh, but while at the same time they continued the savage plunder of the developing world and the working class and the working class and the peasants in 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 the, in the most exploited nations across the world. So you have so you have the, all these have these impacts upon them, but. Uh, then the ultra left, the, the Trotskyists believe that, whoa, oh, now that the communists have been defeated, our day will come now, so our day has arrived. Oh, through, yeah. Let's see. The, the through, socialism, through socialism will emerge. And uh, uh, it turned out to be absolute uh, the Ladybird School of Politics. Uh, that is not the case. That is not the case. 
Uh, it didn't happen and wasn't going to happen either. Uh, there is no such thing as pure socialism. Uh, the correct way to build socialism is socialism is built on the material, the real material conditions that people experience and find themselves in at a given historical moment in time. And so therefore what has emerged, has emerged as socialism, is emerged because of where the contradictions, the balance of forces, where these things happen to life and also the basis of good decisions made and bad decisions made. But to say hindsight is 50-50 vision. You don't make decisions based upon hindsight. You make decisions based upon the balance, weighing up the balance of forces, the issues that you face, the challenges that you have to, have, to, have to confront, and you make the best choice you think you can make. And so therefore, there's no blueprint. To take it out of the cupboard and say, oh, here it is. So Trotsky wrote this, that, therefore that is true. Say, if the books don't reflect reality, what do you do? You can't change reality. You change your books. Change your reading matter, mm. which then gives you a better understanding of potential to understand the reality which you face and the potential solutions that you might come forward with. So people are wrapped up in books, in theory, rather than which is not actually connected to the real lived experience of the balance on the balance of forces globally and locally. And I think that's why that's why you get this confused idea about Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba. Vietnam, China, a lot, all mm. types of weird and wonderful ideas on the left about what is socialism, what is not socialism. Yep. So you've got a check off list. They've got a, they've got the clipboard and they check off. Good, that's socialist. That's socialist. That's not. That's capitalist. That's socialist. That's capitalist. They have a checklist. So they yep. anywhere they, they go to Cuba, they have a checklist. Oh, there are no big shops in Cuba. There's no big supermarkets in Cuba. Well, actually, consumerism isn't one of the key elements of social of socialism. The key element of socialism is about what is the great for what is about is about a social and cultural revolution. They call the change the cultural uh, experience, the cultural conditions of the people. You revolutionize them. You make the people center of that. The people's culture center of that. You provide health service to people. You provide education to people. You provide real material change in the material conditions. And consumerism, consumerism, to two degree, was one of the problems with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union. I try, in the 50s and 60s, adopted the whole idea of consumerism. You cannot out-consume capitalism. You simply can't out-do that. Because capitalism's very nature is about the production of commodities. And it creates all types of false illusions. But you need to have this, you need to have that, you need to have the other. And that's why people are chasing their asses around the place, wanting to change their, they change their smartphones every bloody six weeks, because a new smartphone has come out. They think, that's important. It's no. Is it important? Is it important to have a smartphone? Is it important to have a hospital? It's important to have a smartphone, it's important to have decent education, decent culture, decent environment in which we live. So what the hell is more important? So we have to get, our values are all screwed up because we're living in a world which is created about commodity consumption. Mm -hmm. So this whole union tried to engage in that. You can't out-consume out production of commodity goods. Capitalism, capitalism does it, that's just in very nature. So, so, so Cuba, Cuba doesn't have all these big consumer uh, products, doesn't have all these things, this, that and the other. So, well, so what? Maybe we benchmarked it off it. It's health service. Is this health service better than ours? Then I would say, yeah, by a long, bloody chalk. Is this education system better than ours? By it is, by a long chalk. Is equality between men and women better than ours? It is, by a long chalk. The role of Cuba plays in the world, Does it, which side does it stand on? Does it stand on the side of the oppressed, the marginalized, and those fighting for their freedom, or does it stand with the oppressor? These are the values I look to. I don't look to all this other old nonsense. These are the values which I think are core and are key to the left and are key to working class struggle. What type of world are they building and in whose interest are they building it for? Or who is actively involved in? That change is only brought about by the active participation of the people and about the consciousness of the people. It's the conscious people brings about, the radicalization of the people brings about the radical change. It cannot be brought about by a vanguard, by, by the actions of a vanguard, or the sort of the deed is far more important than the process. I'm sorry, but the process is, is crucial. It is crucial. So that was one of the big problems we have with the Republicans that the deed, the the, the camp, military campaign, was far more important than the objective. Well, the objective was united was on our land and democracy. Then that is, can only be brought about by the people, like socialism. The socialism not be brought about by a revolutionary vanguard or more active vanguard. It's not. That's adventurism. Uh, and yeah, revolutionary yeah. adventurism. It's brought about by the steady, long, boring work of the politicization of the people and the mobilization of the people. But the people become conscious of the necessity for change. And as Mark talked about, how what is a revolution? 
Our evolution is when then the, the old order, the new order no longer wants to be ruled in the old way. And the old order can no longer rule in the old way. And that's how do we bring how do we bring that point? Well, that's where the Communist Party can look on this idea of a transformative strategy. Placing coming forward with demands which which strengthen the hands of labor. I don't mean the Labour Party, I mean the labor of workers and weakens the hands of capital, the bosses. So instead of us constantly fighting every battle, let's, the working class must look more strategically. What, where is the enemy weakest? Where is the enemy most susceptible to political pressure, political struggles that weakens them and strengthens the hands of the working class? And that's about a transformative strategy. That is what we're looking at. Oh, they've talked about the Gramsci school, they've talked about a hegemonic position, building hegemonic blocks. The, so that is a transformative strategy. But where where does our class have power? And where does not have power? Mm. And where do we need to build working class power? Not in the abstract slogan of a paper, but actually, where, where, does, where do workers have power in our society? We have workers standing outside Debenhams. Do we have any power there? No, we don't. We have no bloody rights. We've actually, they've stripped us of all our, whatever rights we had won, have been gradually taken back. And as the old saying goes, you only have rights insofar as you're able to defend them. And we have succeeded, we have ceded so many rights, but we have damn all rights. Workers have damn all rights, so we can't even um, get a decent redundancy payment. And so I think we've got to, we have, we have to look at seriously how, how much, how many rights we have been forced to give away, bargained away through social partnership and various other things, because they say, well, you give us a few quid and we'll give you these rights. Give us a few more quid and we'll give you those, those rights. And we end up we end up with no rights, or very few of them, except going into these uh, emasculating courts called the, the, the Workers' Rights Commissions and all this type of We just come emasculated in bullshit. And I go back to the point, law is but congealed politics. And if you lived in a capitalist society, then the law is about the protection of capital. Nothing more and nothing less. And so unless we get back to this very basic point of not this the vindication of individual rights, but actually the advancement of the collective social class rights of the working class, then we might begin to make progress. Eugene, that was absolutely fantastic. Now, come here to me. It's we, we've just come up on half nine there. Now I am. We, we've we're slightly running over time already. And I'll give you I, ten minutes of this question. If somebody else wants to ask a couple of questions, I'll give you ten minutes more. And after that, I'm going home. I'm going. <laughs> then you're done. Well, and listen, you can sit there and twiddle your own. You can twiddle your own thumb. <laughs> We'll have to figure out the answer ourselves, but listen, listen, what I will say before we go any further is that everybody in the chat, there's there's, there's about 10, 15 people in the chat who are saying that uh, we we need to get Eugene back on uh, again as soon as possible. So Eugene, you're, you're coming back for uh, part two on this. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think it's going to be a long time before that happens either, because let's, let's be honest, we, did, we, we, we kind of brushed over a lot of what happened uh, even within Absolutely. the communist movement. Like we kind of just... Well, we... Sure, that's true, that's true. Sure. I'm a falsifier of history. Sure. Aren't we well known for that? We only, we black out sections of history we don't agree with and we don't like. Yeah, we don't really want to talk about this part, so we're not, we're just not going to. So it's but there, there is probably a bit another half of the story that we're going to need to, to come to someday. Absolutely. So, so I uh, hope another that... Time, no, another time, no bother. It's, a, it's, it's like you have to be honest with your history. If you're not honest with it, then how are you going to learn from it? Yeah, this is it. How are you going to learn if, you don't, if you're not honest? And uh, people also, people are not that stupid. People do see both three bullshit. And so if you're honest with people, I think then they may not believe you at the start, but I think over a period of time, you'll win their confidence and you'll win, you win them. You win them by your actions, by standing side along with them, standing with them, fighting with them, arguing with them, not just accepting what they believe to be right. You must challenge them. You must challenge them because basically what they believe to be right is I, are the ideas and values given to them by this system. I say with, mm. where the hegemonic idea is common sense. The hegemonic idea is capitalism is going to be an organized society. Therefore, in people's heads, they see it as common sense. Mm. Therefore, we, if you allow that to happen, then basically when you become a Labour Party, and you say, well, the people are looking for the roads to be repaired. Yes, of course they do. But did that change anything? You repair the road and not holding the road down further down the road. Somebody else's problem. Does that really fundamentally change the system? Does this fundamentally change anything? No, we have to challenge the ideas in people's heads. We say, the reasons why we've got crap health services is because we've got two health systems. One for the rich and one for the working class. One for the majority. If you can afford to pay for it. Look, I heard the, the, the whinging on the radio because on, on the television tonight about, oh, the, fee pay, the schools who were paying, the grind schools, didn't get adequately represented in the, the points 
in the actual uh, allocation of um, third level places, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so they they thought they by uh, sending the kids to grind schools that they could get a greater advantage to get into college. So what the hell is this? Well, I thought we lived in a democracy. Everybody was equal. But clearly not. Clearly if you've got money, you can get things. You can get you can get into college. You can get a health service. You can get health treatment. You can get a house if you've got money. If you haven't got money, then stand in the queue. We might, we might build a slum and call it social housing or over in the corner there and build a big wall around it so nobody can see it. So this is a, they, they define this all as democracy or common sense, but it's not common sense. Hmm. It's about advancing and protecting the interest of a tiny minority. And we have to look at this. We have to call a spade a spade and say, it's not a shovel, it's a spade. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Conrad. Everybody everybody in the chat's just glowing over you. <laughs> all, you're uh, you're you're very popular now with the uh, with the with the YouTube audience. We're gonna have to get you back sooner rather than later. Um but come here to me. We just there's just a couple of questions here that I that I do want to get because just before we before we finish up. Um okay, so so two two just two ones. Uh one which is a little bit more sort of um abstract and one which is more concrete. We we touched on this a little bit, but um one comrade uh, has asked, what was the position of the CPI uh, in 1939. Uh, now, I think that this was in relation to um, to Spain, to, to the war against Franco and all that sort of stuff. Uh, would you mind just elaborating quickly on, on, on what happened over there? Uh, in Spain? Um, hmm. But Spain it wasn't a fight for socialism. It was a fight uh, against fascism. The Republican government, um, which was elected by the people, uh, elected on the basis of a democratic uh, uh Program a program which was about the redistribution of land, uh, giving more workers more rights. Very more to a degree, they call a left social democratic uh, pro, uh, economic program. But in the context of the thirties, that was very radical. Mm -hmm. um, and the result from that was that the the hard right uh, uh, in Spain, the oligarchs, the uh, la funding, um, the big landlords, the Catholic Church, the big big employer, the big employers, the big owner of capital. Um, uh, rejected this uh, democratic voice of the people. And then Franco um, organized uh, uh, his, the, the army and they land from Morocco and they invaded. Uh, and they basically set about the destruction of the, uh, of the uh, Republican government, um, aided and abetted and supported by uh, active supported with soldiers, uh, uh, weaponry from aircraft, uh, bombers, machine guns, everything else, uh, fighters, or, uh, officers' corps and everything else uh, from Germany, uh, from Germany and Italy, um, and other fascist forces also joined them, um, including Ireland. Um, the international, the 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 common turn, um, the government of Spain was under huge pressure, and with the with the old the the, uh, the fascist forces throwing the weight in behind the the Franco uh, uh, Spanish fascism, um, the the common turn called for the establishment of the international brigades to go to Spain to fight, uh, to fight to defend the Spanish Republic and to defend uh, democracy. And uh, from, from that, then the Communist Party of Ireland organised them, um, uh, what became known as the Colony Column. Um, it was about a couple of hundred volunteers went from Ireland. Uh, they didn't, uh, some of them came from Irish people who were Irish men and women who had, who had maybe emigrated after the, the defeat of the victory of the counter-revolution uh, in the 1920s when it was very difficult in Ireland. A lot of them emigrated. But a lot of them kept in contact and then so you find it's quite a few of them came from Canada, fought in Canada, fought with the United States, fought from Australia. And they linked in too with the uh, with the whole uh, the Connolly column. It was led by uh, Frank Brown, who also Frank Brown became a commander of the International Brigades. Uh, and they fought right up to until 1930, 1938 and then when they were withdrawn. And um, so it was a very uh, a very important moment for us, uh, a very proud moment, but also a very a moment where we know we we lost um, some tremendous comrades, some tremendous thinkers. It, 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 it was a great blow to our party because we lost so many good people there. Um, a blow that we took us a very, very, very long time, decades to overcome and to recover from. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it was a, it was a duty that had to be fulfilled, um, a task that had to be done, and uh, we don't uh, have any regrets that way. We just we just we know that. Um, if we hadn't lost so many good comrades, then maybe the conditions in Ireland would be a lot different, and the strength of the communist movement would be a lot different. 
and would have been a lot different. Um, but these are the things that uh, we fought uh, and we, uh, our comrades gave their lives. So those who fought and returned um, continued that fight, continued that struggle. And uh, we're very proud and indeed honoured uh, to be a member of the same organisation. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thanks very much, comrade. Um, now, I, I did, uh, the person who had asked that question did clarify uh, that they actually weren't asking about the... It was, uh, it was, was Stalin, about... was, that, was it the Molotov, Ribbentrop, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 actually, it's it just just World War Two. I think is generally. But listen, I think we're gonna have to take that one for for the next time. I think we'll have to. Oh, no matter for the next dream. I think we'll have to we'll have to jump into that. And then just quickly, uh, just the last one because this is kind of a, an uplifting one to to end on here. Um, just, I've just been asked, Paul, will there be a discussion um on what Eugene sees uh, as an actual socialist Ireland looking like and how it would operate? I'd love to hear that. So uh, the comrade wants to know what your, your vision is uh, for a socialist or at least a socialist uh, oriented sort of future for Ireland. So that might be a nice place to, to end things up on. Uh, go for it. Okay. Let's let's go. Let's, let's uh, well, use our imagination. Uh, <laughs> well, well, to a degree, we all are, have a, an element of idealism. Uh, I mean, uh, well, of course, yeah, because if, you if you're not sitting at home some night having a beer or a glass of wine or at the back with, you, with your your lover or your partner or whatever, you, whatever you're having yourself, and your mind drifts off to what an Ireland could be. So you, you move into the realm of what you think a possibly better Ireland could look like. Uh, so that's, your, that's the realm of idealism. Um, so you, you, you can do that. Uh, um, but as I say, to go back to the point that um, you can separate uh, the construction of socialism from the real concrete material conditions that you find yourself in, the balance of forces that you have on your side and the balance of forces ranged against you. And also the start of the international context in which things emerge. So if setting them aside, which you can't, but from an idealist point of view, if you set them aside and you say, what sort of Ireland would it look like? I think, well, it would be an Ireland where I, would, I certainly hope would be an Ireland where um, is uh, united, is peaceful, is engaged in uh, a cultural advancement and a cultural revolution, transforming the real cultural experience between men and women, um, the real material relationships between men and women. Um, where we end all this all stupid nonsense because I think machoism, machoism, um, and male chauvinism. I think it prevents men from being fully human. It prevents men from being fully human. Um, and I think so to end that nonsense, to end racism, uh, to end sectarianism, I think they are all important goals for a socialist Ireland to have. I think an important goal would be to have uh, um, a balanced economic and social development across the country, that rural Ireland is not decimated, which is now in the process of happening. Um, that's so they have a more balanced economic and social development across the whole of the Ireland. Um, I think uh, about the preservation of those who farm the land should be able to live and exist on that land. Um, I'm, old, I'm an old fan of Michael Davitt. Michael Davitt, um, uh, his, one of his demands, I think is still very crucial, that the land should be owned by the state, by the people, all of the people. And that farmers should be given a license, a lifetime license to farm and work that land uh, and to develop it uh, and to produce the food that is required by the people. And uh, in other words, to see land to cease to become a commodity for exchange. Um, and I think that would be, so I would like to see that as a, a key element of it, that actually the land would be owned by the people. The farmers who work it would be given a long-term license to work that and also if it needs to be, their families further on, their generations. Um, but I do think it then ceases land, ceases to be capital, ceases to be uh, something which to be exchanged. It's something about land is about returning it to the collective good, the production of goods and foods to meet the needs of the people. So I'd like to see that. And I'd like to see an Ireland where everybody with a house, with a shelter, it ceases to be a commodity. That is a, a, an Ireland where housing is of right um, and there's a collective right that the housing is there because you need it because you require it to keep the rain off you to keep shelter to raise your family 
<clears throat> to go home and have watch the telly or to go in and play chess. Whatever it takes, it's somewhere where you can call yours. <clears throat> um, uh, I don't mean that in the sense of ownership, in the sense of it is yours what you have control over. You pay your rent. You have uh, control over the people who run <clears throat> the city councils and stuff. So that and uh, the question of a health service, which would be <clears throat> centered on the needs of the people rather than uh, the interests of private medicine, private corporations. Medicine is the product of social intellect. It's built upon thousands of years of human experience of understanding the, the, the uh, curing powers of nature, of, of uh, medical and so on. Like so it's not the, not the prerogative or the ownership of uh, individual doctors. It is part of a whole social uh, understanding that is built up over thousands of years. So it shouldn't, doesn't belong to the doctors, it doesn't belong to the, legal, the, the medical profession, it doesn't belong to medical corporations, it belongs to the people. It is the whole lived experience of the people. So I'd like to see public health as being a, a key element, uh, public education, uh, public uh, housing. So just a few thoughts. Eugene McCartan. Thank you very, very much. Anybody from Ireland uh, who's listening, um, I have no doubt you're going to be very curious uh, about how you can get involved with the Communist Party of Ireland. Now, if you're a young comrade, maybe the Connolly Youth Movement, you'll find links below to the Communist Party of Ireland's website. You'll find a link to the Socialist Voice, the, the media outlet for the Communist Party of Ireland. And uh, I think at this stage, there are, are no doubts at all that uh, Eugene McCartan will be coming on probably to do a second part of our of our Irish socialist history, Irish communist history, but also to, to just get more of these uh, fantastic insights uh, from our comrades. So, comrade, thank you very, very much for... for thank you. Good night, everybody, and stay safe. Absolutely. Stay safe. Okay, we'll thank end you. the stream there. Cheers, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.